wanted to reciprocate to Mark Merriweather that not only was he thankful for the youth, but we are thankful for him, for his song leading abilities and for his enthusiasm in evangelism. I've only spent just a few time, uh, times around him, but I can certainly tell that he is one who loves the Lord and loves lost souls. But not only him, we appreciate all those who participate in the worship service, from reading the scriptures to sharing in the singing responsibilities. We are extremely thankful. And that is one of the things that really caught my attention with this congregation is the tremendous love that I see from the congregation, the willingness from the men and even the women to do the work of the Lord. Indeed, there is so much at stake and we are in desperate need of those who are willing to help out and do what the Lord is requiring of them. This evening, we continue our theme having to do with the gifts of God. And as I mentioned earlier this month, I thought that this is a fitting theme, seeing that this is fresh in our minds, especially during this time of year where we begin to look for gifts for one another, for family and friends, and I understand this evening the youth will engage in a gift exchange. So this also gives them an opportunity to think not only upon those gifts, but even now the gift of God. This evening we want to talk about the gift of grace, the gift of God's favor. You know, I was looking this up because I had heard different names from time to time. But no longer was it the founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates, who was considered to be the richest man in the world, but Jeff Bezos now has overtaken him. And he is considered to be worth $169.7 billion. With that type of resource and income, we expect an individual who is wealthy to be a philanthropist, one who will use his abundance for the well-being of society and mankind. After all, they can't take it with them and they can't spend it in their own lifetime. And so therefore, with what they possess, they ought to be willing to use these resources for the betterment of men. And so many of them have. But the reason why we would be suggesting this type of philanthropy is because of the great abundance that they possess. Well, likewise, when it comes to God, God is also depicted within the Word as being abundant, rich in mercy, in grace, and in kindness. And even though God owns all things, what the Bible emphasizes most of all is his virtue. God is rich in virtue. And as a result, he is abundant in these things. And he is wanting to express his kindness and his mercy to all of his creation. Therefore, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, we find passages that suggest this very point. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We drop down to verse 7, That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God wants us to know him from that perspective. The world has done a good job in depicting God as one who is critical, who is overbearing, one who is judgmental. And even though we know that one day we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and have to go undergo an analysis, what the Bible often is declaring is not his judgment, but rather his love, his goodness, that he is abundant 
in this virtue and in these qualities. And so when we think to ourselves, especially at this time of the year, what does God offer us? What is the great benefit and advantage of being his child or a disciple of Jesus Christ? He gives us gifts. And one of the gifts that we would like to think upon this evening is the gift of God's grace, his favor. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, in the very same context, Paul goes on to explain, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So when we read this context, we should walk away with an understanding that there was nothing that we could offer God to win or gain his favor, because everything that we possess is already his. Everything that we have, he has given to us. And so therefore, what we realize is that God shows us favor based upon his own choosing, based upon his own willingness. And so the scripture says, it is not by works, lest anyone should boast. No one among us could say, well, look how good I am, or look at the things that I have done, or consider the type of family that I have come from, because nothing, nothing in this world can be given to God to win his attention or his favor. But as the scripture says here, by grace you have been saved through faith. Well, the word grace simply makes reference to favor. And in certain contexts, the word itself would be suggestive of a gift. And so in thinking about our existence in this world, we have to stop and remind ourselves there are many times that we have done wrong towards God. There are many times that we have been ugly in our character. But yet God, in his word, still declares unto us that we are made in his image and we are his creation and he will not forsake us. Well, let us consider grace in action. In the Old Testament, I believe that there is a great example that will demonstrate God's grace. We often talk about his favor. We often talk about him saving us, even though we have done wrong. But a great example can be found in the book of Exodus chapter 32, verses nine through 14. In Exodus chapter 32, we remember, we remember the context of where the Israelites had just been delivered from Egyptian bondage. And for this, they should have considered a great blessing and in return should have been willing to be faithful to God and wait upon Moses, wait upon God's instructions. But you might remember the context there the people began to grow wearisome in waiting for Moses, and ultimately they fell back to the traditions that they were accustomed to under Egyptian bondage, and began to look for some idol, some object to place their confidence or their trust in. And as a result, God's anger was kindled. And in Exodus chapter 32, verses nine through 14, Notice the conversation between Jehovah God and Moses. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. 
Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. On this occasion, I believe this is a perfect illustration of what it means to enjoy God's favor and receive his, his grace as a gift. Because whether we realize it or not, we too were in the same situation and possibly still remain in the same situation. Due to our disobedience, due to our rebellion and stubbornness, when after time and time again, we may have heard lesson upon lesson about characteristics, about actions, about things that we pursue, telling us that they are wrong and yet we still continue to go after them. How do you suppose God responds? If we were in the Old Testament, where the miraculous power of God was still at work, how many of us would still be alive this very hour? And so in this context, we receive grace in action. I have no doubt that our destruction has been considered many times. Maybe not personally, but the world in general. I have no doubt that just like in the book of Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, that when God looks down from heaven upon earth, he continues to see that there is none who seek after him. And as a result, it repents the Lord. It causes him to take a step back and reconsider what he is doing and why he is waiting. In the book of Psalm 78, notice another occasion where we find this explanation. Psalm 78, verses 36 through 39. In the context here, the psalmist is rehearsing in a song and in a prayer the history of Israel of how from time and time again they were disobedient and God saved them. And we look here in Psalm 78 verses 36 through 39. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth and they lied to him with their tongue. God had saved them and in return they were simply giving him lip praise. But as the New Testament declares, their heart was far from him. They lied to him with their tongue. Have we found ourselves doing that? Oh, Lord God, if you would simply bless me with better health, may I have better results, just know that I will be at the worship service every time the days are open, the doors are open. Oh, Lord, if you would give me this in my life, just know that I will dedicate and sacrifice my life to you. When in reality, deep in our heart, we might know that we are simply flattering God and, and lying to him with our tongue. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenants. But consider, but he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and, not, and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath, for he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. How often they provoked him in the wilderness. How often do we provoke God in our lives? But in looking at this context, it reminds us of what grace truly is. Because God has the power to destroy us. God has the power, as the song often sung, to call down 10,000 angels to destroy the world and glorify his son. But instead, God is patient. He is abundant and rich in his mercy, in his kindness, and in his favor. He has enough to go around. And even though he has spent it once or twice on us, he will continue to spend his grace, his favor, and his kindness, regardless of how often we may have failed him. But he does so because 
He is hoping for our development. There used to be a song that I enjoyed as a kid. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It says it take him, took him just a week to make the sun, the moon, and the stars, but he's still working on me. And so likewise, God is extending us this grace and this divine favor because he is still working on us, hoping for our development and our perfection. But know this, that even though God is abundant in his mercy and in his grace, one day it will come to an end. And that's exactly what we're standing here, sitting here, listening to and reminding ourselves about. Before that time should come, we want to make a desperate approach to making certain that we are not found wanting or unprepared on that great day of God's wrath. In the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, you might remember there that Paul is given assurance to those Christians who are suffering that one day the justice of God will rain down. And he says, to you who are troubled, rest with us. It was a comforting thought to those who were suffering that one day God will bring justice. But notice how he describes it. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints. We remind ourselves of this because even though grace abounds, the Apostle Paul declared a rhetorical question, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? The answer was, God forbid. Even though we know that God is good and he is abundant in his rich mercy, we don't ever want to take him for granted because God knows the depths of our heart. He knows our innermost thoughts. And so therefore, from time to time, when we have failed and faltered and our lives are filled with shortcomings, we might get right back up and do his will, but know that we are seeking for betterment, we are seeking for perfection in his righteousness. But if he sees that we are simply taking him for granted, well, that wrath shall come upon us on that last day in flaming fire. Let us do all that is in our power to escape that judgment. While we are now drawing breath alive, well, with good health, surrounded by family and friends, let us awake out of the stupor of sin and get back on our feet and continue marching towards Zion this very hour. Why would anyone want to hold on to their sin and live a life that is burdensome? As we mentioned this morning, this is not where the true joy of Jesus Christ comes from. It might be simply happenstance, based upon our circumstances, based upon the success of the moment. It might bring excitement, but the true joy of Jesus Christ can be found here in realizing that we have God's divine favor. And even though we have failed him from time to time, he still extends his arms. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, he says. But number two, we find the grace of God in sincerity. You know, Christ died for even the worst of us. Notice in the book of Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners or still sinners, Christ died for us. I know it's hard to believe that Christ died for even the worst of us. The Apostle Paul declared himself to be the chief of sinners. 
But let's put it in today's perspective. I might be getting this name wrong, but I believe years ago, there was a mass murderer who was imprisoned, heinous in his crimes, and yet the gospel was presented to him, I think somewhere near this area, and he obeyed the gospel. And hearing his name, we perhaps would gasp because of the type of character this man demonstrated, the kind of life that he lived, the crimes that he was involved in, but yet we say again, Christ died for even the worst of us. And even though we may not have committed mass murder or been involved in heinous crimes like this individual, again I say, as I said a few weeks ago, even the smallest lie will keep us out of heaven. And even the smallest imperfection of darkness is something that will ruin our favor with God. And so therefore, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 reminds us that God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means something. Because he didn't have to come to this world. He didn't have to be treated in the manner in which he was treated. He was certainly justified if he would have called down angels to destroy the world. But yet he did this for you and me. He did this so that we can have an opportunity to enjoy eternal life with him. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us he did this so that we can recognize what kind of God he is. He is not a tyrant. He is not one who is critical. He is not one who is judgmental, but rather he is one full of love. And this is what we mean by grace and sincerity. God extends his favor in these difficult times to demonstrate his goodness to really show us who he is. People are good when others are good to them. It's easy. But when others are not good to us, it becomes a little bit more difficult to treat someone with respect when they are not respecting you. It flares up your anger. It causes your mind to race with thoughts of how you want to respond. But the Bible demonstrates that God is not like this. Some people are good in times of distress to hold it over others so that they can say, well, I was good to you when you did this to me. And they use it somewhat as emotional manipulation. Sometimes you find this in relationships, in friendships. But this is not so with God. God is not demonstrating his goodness so that he could hold it over us to manipulate us, but rather he continually, time and time again, is good towards us to demonstrate that he is genuine in his love and in his favor. He knows what he created. As Psalm 78 described, he remembers that we are but flesh and that we are subject to failure, but at the same time, even though we're flesh, he knows that we were created in his image and had the potential for faithful obedience. And therefore, he extends his favor. And he tells us, get back up, try again. Get back up, continue struggling on. In the book of 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, you might remember a key passage. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. This is one of his attributes, his characteristics. When we describe God and the unchangeableness of his nature, we often depict him as omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing omnipresent, everywhere at once, immutable, unchangeable, but it's based upon this idea of love. Love is what God wants us to know about him and his character, which is tantamount to saying that he is truth and he is light. Love, truth, and light are synonyms one of another. And in this context, we are seeing 
that it's in his nature to forgive. It is his joy, which is why his anger is justified when we continually reject him. And so when we think about it all, this month, as we sit around and pass gifts to one another, we have been given a tremendous gift, the gift of God's favor, his grace. And as we mentioned a few Sundays ago, God spared no expense to make certain that we have this gift, not only in this time of year, but every single day of our lives. Isn't this what the prophet Jeremiah wrote in the book of Lamentations chapter three? As we begin to conclude our thoughts and wrap this entire deal up, we turn to the, the book of Lamentations chapter three. You remember there what was occurring? God had been warning the nation of Israel for many years to repent of their sins, to turn from their ways so that he might heal them. This was the promise that even Solomon prayed about back in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. If only my people would humble themselves and hear my voice, I would turn and I would heal them. But the people, due to their rebellion, were unwilling to do so. And in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, as Jeremiah is sitting and he is looking at the desolate city, at the destruction of the temple, at his people laid in waste. He could not help but shed a tear and cry out, it is through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Let that be your declaration this evening. If you find yourself in sin and in disobedience, rest assured that while you are still alive, God extends his favor. And he's wanting you to come on back. He's wanting you to get right back up and continue faithfully living the Christian life. And it's on occasions like this where we can remind ourselves where you have brethren, brothers and sisters singing hymns of love, of tenderness, that we have a great family. Why would we ever turn our back on such things? That we have a great God. And even though I have failed him this day, if the Lord will, let me sleep and awake tomorrow for again, his mercies and his grace will be renewed. And let me try once more. If there is one here this evening, a member of the body of Christ, and has allowed themselves to drift away, this is what the Lord is calling for. He's calling for us to consider our ways, to turn from the path of sin unto the path of righteousness. He's wanting us to humble ourselves, confess our sins, knowing that Jesus Christ is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. But if we are not yet members of the body of Christ, then know that you are missing out on God's favor this very hour. But he is wanting you to know his goodness and his love. He's not doing it by some magical or mystical way. He simply wants you to sit down, open up his word, search the scriptures, hear the story, the great saga of love from the fall of man to the renewal of their soul in Jesus Christ's blood. And in believing that story, he wants you to change your ways, to repent of your sins to recognize sin for what it is, to understand that this world is temporary, to turn away, confess him as Lord, and put him on in baptism, which is simply a burial. It is a burial to sin, where we can resurrect to the newness of life, ever to live faithful unto death. If there is one here this evening, will you come as all together we stand and sing?